On Law Weekly today, we chat with another of the presidential candidates for the Nigerian Bar Association elections, Dr. Babatunde Ajibade SAN. He shares with us the role he thinks the bar should play, his vision for a united bar, and much more. We also have our weekly recap of the top trending stories from the courtrooms. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shieli. Last week on the show, I began a series of interesting conversations with the presidential candidates of the Nigerian Bar Association elections. The elections which shall be conducted by e-voting has now been rescheduled to commence from midnight on the 29th of July to 11.59 p.m. of the 30th of July 2020. My guest today is Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Babatunde Ajibade, simply called Dr. Ajibade by his friends and supporters. He studied at the Obafemi Awolowo University for his first degree and subsequently went on to King's College, University of London, where he obtained his LLM and his PhD. Dr. Ajibade was called to the bar in 1989. He was elevated to the rank of SAN in December 2007. I kicked off the interview with his views on the dual role of the Nigerian Bar Association to its members and the public. Is one role suffering at the detriment of the other? And which role should have more priority? Here's our chat. Personally, I think the MBA ought to do both. I don't think it should be either or. Um, and I don't think it's a case of the MBA is not doing the latter. I think the MBA has spoken out uh, in recent times when it has had to. I think it's really, my view is that we need to go beyond just um, talking. I mean, obviously you can make statements, uh, make pronouncements, and I think the MBA has done that uh, pretty regularly. Um, but I think we need to now go beyond just making statements to actually doing things that will change uh, some of the ills that we see yeah, in, in society. Well, we need to engage. I think we need to engage a bit more proactively with the actors in, um, in society, with government. Um, if government does something that is untoward uh, and the MBA makes a statement, it okay. shouldn't, shouldn't stop at just Yeah, exactly. It shouldn't statement. stop at just making a statement. I think we need to engage constructively uh, with government. Uh, and by government, I mean all the arms, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, which is our own um, constituency, really. As you know, the judiciary is the only arm of government that is exclusively monopolized by our profession. Mm -hmm. So really, I think the MBA has to be playing a much more proactive role than um, the statements. Because people, those who make such claims say that because the NBA is not doing much, that's why you see the body of senior advocates talking, intervening in some issues. That's why you see a group like the Justice Reform Project, you know, starting to take prominence and chasing some of the issues that the NBA should be chasing. Do you, do you, what do you think of those groups speaking on behalf of maybe the NBA sometimes or championing causes that people feel that the NBA should have been championing? You know, my, my view is that we must work towards having a united bar, a united profession. But even within that united profession, there will be, you know, different interests. Um, some might be more concerned about some issues than others. And I don't see any harm in um, different groups like the Justice Reform Project, the Capital Markets Solicitors Association, the Employment and Labor Lawyers Association, for example. Um, speaking about things that are particularly particular concern them. Um, the important thing for me, I think, for the MBA is to make sure that it is a broad church that accommodates everybody uh, and accommodates everybody's concerns as best as it can. In one of your recent interviews, you described yourself as an independent-minded person who has never received or sought patronage from government. So you'll be able to confront the political class when necessary. You said that, right? Yes. But there are those, maybe call them critics if you like, who say that you're not known for any form of activism and that, well, I don't know, they don't know whether you'll be able to confront some of the issues when they arise. How would you respond to that? I think activism comes in different forms. Um, for me, activism is not necessarily about noise. It's not necessarily about making noise and carrying placards. Activism sometimes is about how you go about your business how you relate. Um, and sometimes I think you, know, you, you can lead by setting examples 
not necessarily by what you say, but by what you do. Uh, personally, uh, I, I think that the way I have practiced law over the years, the way I have directed the firm that I have the privilege of managing to practice law over the years uh, is activism in itself because we, we have consciously tried not to go with the flow. And you know, everybody's doing it, so we should do it too. That for me is leadership. If you will, what, what is your idea of the ideal MBA, the body? What should, what should it be doing? What do you think is the ideal for the MBA, its role? I think the ideal for the MBA is first and foremost an organization that looks out for the interests of its members. Um, because I think it is only when the members of the MBA themselves are well taken care of and well looked after that they can perform effectively all the other roles that society expects of lawyers. I think the situation we have now over the years has been one in which the interests of lawyers have been so poorly uh, looked after that lawyers themselves have not then been able to perform the role that society expects of them because uh, as I say to people, the, the first law of nature is self-preservation. A lawyer who is not able to feed his family uh, is not likely to be able to focus on protecting the rights of members of society. Yeah. His or her first uh, focus is going to be on, you know, I need to solve my own problems first. So I think the MBA must first look after its members because by so doing, it empowers those members to look after the rest of society. The welfare of lawyers. It's one of the greatest challenge facing the legal profession, issues of unemployment, poor pay of lawyers, lack of opportunities, inadequate training for the young army of lawyers. It's an issue that trends on social media from time to time. So what have you done in the past to address some of these issues? And what would you do if you become president of the bar? What I've done in the past within the sphere of my limited um, scope of authority is, at least with lawyers in our own firm, we've encouraged them uh, as best as we can to try to improve themselves. Uh, we've mentored them to try to develop um, expertise in specific areas of law because I'm, I'm of the view that the day of the Jack of all trades, master of none lawyer is long gone. So specialization? Yeah, specialization I think is critical. Do um, you pay them well though? By my estimation we do. Um, I, can't, I can't really judge. But we, we have lawyers who've been with us for 12, 13, 14 years. I, I would love to believe that if we weren't paying well, they would have they moved have taken on. taken away. Yeah. Okay. But in terms of if I if I succeed in my aspiration to be president of the MBA, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. But you know, the starting point right now is I don't think we even have a grip on the dimension of the problem. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence, which I don't dispute that you know, lawyers are not being paid adequately. Um, but I also know that there are quite, you know, there are a few lawyers who have been paid adequately. Because some will say it's just Lagos and Port Harcourt and Abuja. Well, that is the precise point. We don't know. We don't even know how many lawyers there are in Lagos, Port Harcourt, Abuja, Ikote, Pwene, Otukbo, Elisha, Ife. So you, you can't plan or deal adequately uh, with a problem if you don't know the dimensions of the problem. So my priority, uh, if, if I'm elected MBA president, is to actually dimension the problem. And also look at the problem not just from the point of view of um, remuneration, but also look at the problem from the point of view of income generation. You know, because it's two sides of a coin. Uh, I was saying to somebody just this morning that the, the criteria that we use uh, in the profession now, young lawyer, senior lawyer, which is if you're seven years post-call or less, you're a young lawyer. And once you become seven years, three days, you suddenly transmute <laughs> into a senior, senior lawyer. I, I think it's too arbitrary. Um, I think a more realistic um, criteria, if we must have one, is lawyers who are in employment and lawyers who are employed. 
because the young lawyers who are, well, using the current criteria, the, the lawyers who are five years post-call, who already run their own firms and themselves employ other lawyers. Now, those lawyers who are employed in those firms, who may also be dissatisfied with the remuneration they get, both the employer and the employee, they're both young lawyers in these circumstances. And you also have lawyers who are 15, 20 years post-call, who are still in employment, and are also dissatisfied with their remuneration. The fact that we describe them as they're no longer young lawyers doesn't mean that they don't also have a remuneration problem. Yeah. So I think we should look at it more in terms of you know, lawyers who are employed and lawyers who are doing the employing, or organizations that are doing the employing, uh, and then find a way of addressing both sides of, of that problem. Let's talk about um, your vision for the bar. You know, I joined the profession 31 years ago. Um, and when I aspired to join the profession, it was, aside from the fact that I, you know, I had a, I already had a passion for it, uh, and I guess because I, I, my father is a lawyer, so I was, I already had some idea of what the profession was like. But then it was also because it was a dignified profession, it was an honorable profession. If you said you were a lawyer, if you went into a gathering, just the fact that you say you're a lawyer, you know, commanded you some, some respect. And I'm not talking about the, you know, arms akimbo kind of respect. I'm not talking about arrogance, but just, just respect that, oh, this, is a, this must be a responsible member of society. He's a learned person. The learned person, exactly. All that has gone. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we must do everything we can to bring it back. Uh, I mean, same thing with our judiciary. It was, I mean, maybe it was even extreme in those days. You could, you know, if a, if a judge was passing, you'd even hear the, the decibels, the level of the conversation would go down. Ah, oh, it's a judge, judge. Out of respect. Out of respect. That was the kind of aura that our profession had. Mm. All that is gone. How, how did we lose it? I think we just allowed standards to fall. By we, we, by we, you mean collectively? Collectively, yes. Okay. Collectively, we allow standards to fall. Um, because the input you know, cannot but have an effect on the output. So back in the day, and I'm generalizing, of course, but back in the day, it was the best of the bar that went to the bench. That's why they commanded that respect. Because even when they were at the bar, their colleagues at the bar knew that these were the best of us. So when they went to the bench, it was natural that this was our colleague stepping up to um, the next level. Uh, and that respect went with them. Um, we, we, we've lost that. We've lost that because you know, there, there, there are quite a lot of very good judges in our judiciary today. But the truth is, the sense I get is that the majority uh, are not of the same caliber as what we had before. So if you ask me, one of the things we must fix uh, immediately is the entry point. We must make it a lot more uh, stringent. We must make the, the process for appointing uh, uh, judges uh, a lot more stringent. So I hear what you say about the entry points to the bench, but let's talk about the bar. Okay. Because there's a lot of, some people will say there's a lot of indiscipline in the bar. And they finger senior lawyers like yourself. I mean, when you talk about corruption in the judiciary, people would say that it's the senior lawyers who are used as conduit from the politicians to the, to the bench. So issues of discipline in the profession, what are you going to do differently about that? You know, if there's a problem, we, 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 we are dissembling when we start trying to attach that problem to a particular group uh, and exclude the other group. Corruption and indiscipline in our profession is not a senior lawyer problem. It's a problem in the profession as a whole, both on the bar and at the bench. Just to give you an example, and I'm not, you say again, and, and I, 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 we must accept blame across board. So maybe let's take the, the, the bar first. It takes two to tango. How do you uh, establish corruption? Typically, if you have a, a lawyer who is engaged in bribing a judge, there's a communality of interest between the, the offeror and the offeree. So how does, does a third party establish that a bribe has, has, has exchanged hands? Now, the way we tend to 
um, identify that in our profession today is when we see what lawyers might consider to be, in quotes, funny judgments. Mm. You know, you think the law is settled, this is clear, and then all of a sudden it's There's gone a in a different direction. Mm. So there might be some instances where that happens, but then there's so many cases that are in, in the middle ground, because that is why you have an appellate system. Judges are human. They're entitled to get it right and they're entitled to get it wrong. Where we do ourselves a disservice is where every time a lawyer loses a case, he now goes out screaming corruption because he lost the case without considering the fact that, you know, somebody had to win and somebody had to lose. And as I say to my colleagues, you know, if you're selling a product and you yourself are the one going around saying this product stinks, nobody's going to buy it. And then we wonder why we've lost respect in society. So I'm not disputing the fact that there's corruption, but I think we need to dimension it properly. Let's um, go to the politics of, of the elections now. Um, you complained about, you accused the leadership of the Egbe Amofi of lack of transparency and fairness in its endorsement of one of your colleagues as a, its sole candidate for the elections. But there are those who say that this is an afterthought. You submitted to the process, so why would you turn around and complain about the same process that you submitted to? So, let's start from the question of submission mm -hmm. to the process. I was invited to attend the meeting of Egbe Amofi by the de facto leader of Egbe Amofi, Chief Wolani Pekwensen. Prior to that invitation, I was aware that one of the contenders or contestants for the office I seek uh, had a familial relationship with Chief Wolani in attending the meeting of Egbe Amufi, I didn't have any idea of how it was going to, how the proceedings were going to be conducted. So until you started running for office of presidency, you had never taken part in their proceedings? In the Egbe In the Egbe Amufi? No, of course I had. Okay. And I'm talking about the particular, particular meeting, one. yeah, okay. the particular meeting where uh, the issue of whether I submitted to the process ar arose. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for me, the fact that the leader of the association uh, and one of the contestants uh, had that familiar relationship. Of course, it's a, it raised a, an obvious conflict of interest. You know, we're, we're lawyers after all. So when I attended the meeting, my expectation was that something would be done to insulate the leadership from the selection process, at least to give me the comfort that you know, because I couldn't insist, I couldn't ask the leadership to abdicate its position just, before, just because it had a familiar relationship with uh, one of the contestants. We couldn't suddenly change the leadership of Egbe Amofi for that purpose. So a process was set up. And that process, if properly managed, perhaps might have assuaged my concerns. As in, okay, we've set up a committee. Um, the committee is going to look at you guys who have shown interest, and we're going to decide which of you we should support. And the question was raised there and then at the Egbe Amofi meeting that what criteria is going to be used to select? You know, is it how tall you are? Is it your complexion? Is it the number of degrees you have? Is it your international exposure, et cetera? And the result was the committee knows what to do. It is that process that I've said is unfair because absent clear criteria that was going to be used, it was obvious to me that this was more a case of we already know where we're going. We're just going through the motions. Yeah, because get... the candidates should be aware of what exactly. would guide the process. Exactly. I mean, and some said, I mean, I've heard this subsequently that, oh, uh, it's like a student asking, asking for the syllabus. So of course, why shouldn't the student ask? How do you know? How do you know what to study if you don't have a syllabus? So, I, and, and you know, and contrary to what has been said, I did not withdraw from the process after, as an afterthought. I withdrew from the process immediately. I came to the conclusion that this process is not fair. I withdrew from the process. I believe in um, early November. The Egbe Amofin did not take a decision until December. 
So for those who say I withdrew from the process after I lost, that's, that's clearly false. You know, and to, to my mind, if the, if the leadership of Egbe Amofin had handled the, the, the process better, then this issue would not have arisen. If they had insulated, if they had tried to create a, a level playing field, um, so that the, the, the larger body, because at the end of the day, Egbe Amofin claims to be representative of the interest of all Yoruba lawyers. Mm -hmm. It's quite clear to me today that all Yoruba lawyers don't share uh, the view uh, that the Egbe Amofi uh, has said is the view of all Yoruba lawyers. That is not the case and subsequent events have shown that quite clearly. Welcome back. Next week on the program, God willing, we'll talk with a third presidential candidate who has been cleared by the electoral body, Mr. Olumide Apata. So if you have questions you would like me to put across to him, be sure to send them via any of our social media handles. But just before we go, let's do a quick recap of some of the top legal stories we tracked at the court. We begin with the report that the Court of Appeal sitting in Abuja, the Federal Capital Territory, has dismissed the suit filed by a former National Chairman of the All Progressives Congress, Adam Zashomole, challenging his suspension from the party. A three-man panel of judges presided over by Justice Uchechuku Onyemenam unanimously dismissed the appeal at the request of the former APC national chairman, who sought to withdraw same. Oshomali had approached the appeal court to seek a stay of execution on the judgment of the High Court, affirming his suspension. Justice Nlami Senchi of the Abuja High Court had given effect to the suspension of Oshomali from his ward on the ground that the executives of Ward 10 in Esako West local government area of Edo State acted in line with the constitution of the party. In a related suit, Justice Nlami Senchi has also dismissed the suit instituted by Mustafa Salihu and five others, which had on March the 4th led to the suspension of Oshomale from further acting as the national chairman of the ruling party. Justice Senchi dismissed the suit at the request of the applicants during the resumption of the case. The plaintiff's lawyer, Uluwale Afalabi, moved a motion to withdraw the case. He told the court that the withdrawal of the suit was sequel to the directive by leaders of the APC that all court cases be discontinued in the interest of peace. Still in Abuja, another panel of the Court of Appeal has reserved judgment in the appeals filed by the People's Democratic Party and its governorship candidate Musa Wada as well as Natasha Akpoti of the Social Democratic Party challenging the re-election of Kogi State Governor Mr. Yahaya Bello. At the final hearing of the appeal, WADA's counsel, Jibrin Okutak Basan, asked the appellate court to upturn the decision of the Kogi State Governorship Election Petition Tribunal. He insisted that there were overwhelming evidence that the election was marred by electoral malpractices. On his part, counsel for the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Dr. Alex Izion, asked the court to dismiss the appeals. Lawyers to Governor Bello and the All Progressives Congress, Joseph Daudu and Ahmed Raji, aligned themselves with the submission of Dr. Izinyo. After listening to the arguments, the five-man panel of justices, led by Justice Adamu Joro, reserved judgment in the appeals. Another federal high court, also in Abuja, has struck out a suit seeking the disqualification of Governor Godwin Obasaki from contesting the September 2020 governorship election in the state for allegedly forging his university certificate. Justice Anwuli Chikere struck out the suit following the absence of the lawyers to the plaintiffs and defendants. The suit was filed on May 29, 2020 by three plaintiffs ahead of the governorship election scheduled to hold in Edo State on September the 19th. The plaintiffs had alleged in the abandoned suit that the University of Ibadan certificate which Governor Obasaki attached to his form CF001 to INEC for his first term election in 2016 was forged. The Lagos High Court sitting in the Ikeja area has asked the Office of the Public Defender to take over the defense of alleged kidnap kingpin Chuku Dumeme Onwamadike, also known as Evans, owing to his alleged inability to afford his legal fees. Justice Akim Oshodi, who gave the directive, noted that Evans had developed a habit of engaging the services of lawyers who, according to the judge, disappeared halfway through the trial, and this has caused delays in the case. Evans is standing trial alongside four others over the alleged kidnap of Mr. Donatus Dunu, the chief executive officer of Maiden Pharmaceutical Limited. And we round off with the report that another federal high court is set to hear a suit challenging the conviction.
of popular Nollywood actress Funke Akindele and her husband, Abdul Rashid Bello, popularly known as JJC Skills. Justice Maureen Ongetenu fixed the 10th of July to hear the suit, which was filed by Lagos lawyer Olukoya Ogungbeje. In the suit, Ogungbeje is seeking the declaration that the law upon which Akindele and others were convicted was inconsistent with the 1999 constitution. He also argues that the arrest, arraignment, trial, conviction and sentencing of Akindele and others lacks legal backing. Funke Akindele and others were arrested, tried and convicted for violating the Lagos State Infectious Diseases Emergency Prevention Regulations 2020. The actress had hosted a birthday party in her residence to celebrate her husband's birthday. And this is where we are John till next week. Don't forget that you can find this episode of the program and past episodes on our YouTube channel. After viewing, be sure to leave us a feedback. I am Shola Shieli. Thank you for watching.